to the Gestalt A Town. I'm your host, Tom Hollingsworth, and each week we meet to run down some of the IT news that's been happening over the past seven days with a little bit of snarkiness. Uh, I'm your host, and I am joined today uh, in the great Hoosier State by my colleague and friend, Mr. Ken Nalbone. Ken, how are you today? I'm wonderful, and I wish I had known ahead of time that it was Polar Bear Day. I would have invited my kindergartner because she can tell you everything about polar bears. She learned about them in class, even corrected me when I said that, you know, hey, do they hunt penguins? She said, no, polar bears are Arctic, penguins are Antarctic. So, you know, those kindergartners, they always know more than you, especially about polar bears, apparently. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, uh, you've, we've already learned something today on the rundown, and that's the important thing is educating the listeners and the viewers that we've got out there. You're welcome, everybody. So thanks for joining us, Ken. Speaking of cold, let's get on to some of the great news. We're going to start out with uh, probably one of the frostiest receptions that we've seen in quite a while, and that would be over at Mobile World Congress, which is happening in Barcelona this week. Um, Huawei, uh, everyone's favorite mobile device manufacturer from China, um, had a big presence there, um, but and they debuted some uh, updated laptops, new smartphones, a foldable phone that looks like it's probably not complete garbage. Hey, Samsung, how's it going? <laughs> um, but joining them at the show was a large delegation from our U.S. government who uh, was sent to convince telecom executives and allied government officials not to use Huawei's 5G equipment. In one of the most explicit warnings ever since the FBI warning at the beginning of videotapes, uh, Robert Strayer, ambassador for cyber and international communications at the U.S. State Department, called Huawei, and I quote, duplicitous and deceitful and that using Huawei infrastructure puts everyone at risk of Chinese spying. This comes at the same time that 11 U.S. senators called for a ban on Huawei solar power inverters, which they see as a threat to national infrastructure. We've seen Vodafone CEO Nick Reed estimate that avoiding Huawei equipment could delay the 5G rollout in Europe by up to five years. Ken, are we surprised to see such explicit lobbying at such a major trade show from the U.S. government? Uh, nothing surprises me anymore because they keep on lobbying or er, lobbying salvos at Huawei, the U.S. government, that is, uh, and they've been very vocal in their anti-Huawei crusade. Uh, this kind of feels like the high stakes version of when you go to a trade show and one vendor is talking trash about another trying to steal their customers, except now it's a government against a, you know, somewhat nationalized, uh, uh, you know, tech company from another country that we don't have the great greatest relationship with. That's what it reminds me of. Um, I tell you what, the U.S. government better be right because they are doing everything they can to tarnish Huawei's reputation. And I don't think that there's much that the company can do now to stem the tide and salvage that unless they did some kind of 180 and convinced the U.S. government that they were OK. Uh, and, you know, the 5G rollout being delayed, well, we're going to get to a little bit more on that. It, pretty soon here with another story anyway but you know what what's the alternative yeah Huawei. this this is what i find is funny is the u.s government is basically pulling out all the stops they have a tiger team that flies around and tells people don't use huawei i've heard stories here in the u.s of right. people that were looking at using huawei communications equipment and they get a, a visit from a guy in a black sedan and an ill-fitting suit that's uh, saying you know you really shouldn't use that um, kind of thing. And it just feels wrong. Uh, and, and let's face it, we're not exactly uh, sitting in an iron house throwing rocks. This is a the, the glassiest greenhouse you've ever seen because mm, NSA, imagine that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think this is this is all not going to get any better until someone brokers a piece between these two companies and there's some kind of a trade agreement that gets exchanged or something like that. But I don't see this getting better anytime soon. No, me neither. Yeah. All right. Well, moving on to some exciting news regarding cloud. Um, the information.com reports that Microsoft and VMware are working on a VMware virtualization offering on Microsoft Azure. It's part of a larger partnership that will be announced in coming months. The offering will reportedly simplify mass migration of on-premises workloads to Azure. The move would seemingly give Azure feature parity with AWS's existing VMware integration, which was launched back in 2016. This all comes from anonymous sources, so please make sure you take it with a grain of salt and a shot of whiskey. Uh, if it does come to pass, is, is this simply catch up for Microsoft uh, catching up to AWS? Or is Microsoft's existing on-premises server customer base and their previously frosty relationship with VMware the much bigger story here, Ken? Well, I think it's kind of something that Microsoft needed to do. I think they conceded that, you know, they weren't going to win the hypervisor war a long time ago and that customers are going to use VMware and they, they stopped caring really, I think about that. 
Uh, not to say it's not still a product. They just, you know, don't really put a whole lot into it. But if people are going to use another hypervisor, then there isn't that ease of portability of applications uh, unless they broker this deal. And it's kind of funny because they tried this already without VMware's blessing back in late 2017, I want to say. They basically announced, hey, guess what? Now we're going to have compatibility for VMware workloads in Azure. Uh, we're using VMware partners, not VMware themselves, I didn't mention. Even some Microsoft employees were out there tweeting with a hashtag VMware on Azure. And, you know, there were a lot of there was a, a statement pretty shortly thereafter from VMware. This is not a supported offering. We are not working with Microsoft on this. So to kind of see this develop now, even though it is just a rumor, it's kind of funny to see. Um, I think it makes sense. So I know I'm, we're supposed to take it with a grain of salt, but I'm not that salty right now. Uh, I, I tend to think that this makes sense and wouldn't be surprised if it t turns out to be true. Um, now, I will say that just by offering this doesn't mean that, you know, enterprises seeking a cloud strategy have the answer. Uh, everybody will pretty much agree that lift and shift as your sole step in getting your existing data and workloads into the cloud is a terrible idea, but it is the first step in eventually refactoring. So you can make use of all the buzzwords like, you know, service mesh and microservices and Kubernetes and, and, and whatever the case may be. By the way, I hope everybody's buzzword bingo card is now complete. Mine is. Um, okay. In fact, I got a blackout on this one. Uh, way to go, Ken. Yeah, the, the, this is this is catch up. This is this it is, is. But but it's not catch up on Microsoft's part. This is catch up on VMware's part. Because... Not only that, I think it's admission that for IBM or finally that the hypervisor is a commodity because they don't expect anybody to to move into a cloud provider provider like AWS or Azure and stay on their hypervisor. They expect them to, as we said, refactor. And it's clear that their focus now is on things like containers and network virtualization. And they just want to assist customers in using those products and services once they move to the cloud anyway. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a that's a big thing that will be coming out is that, you know, VMware is going to have to start figuring out how to stop the bleed of customers that are refactoring workloads instead of just hoping that they're going to continue to run um, ESXi in the cloud at, you know, for the rest of eternity. <laughs> All right, so uh, Ken, I got a quick question for you. Do you have a 5G smartphone? I do not. My smart, my phone is very, barely smart to begin with anyway. Well, there you go, and I guess what? Nobody else does either, and it probably mm -hmm. won't be for a while either. At a media event, Intel's networking chip head, Sandra Rivera, advised reporters that it's begun sampling 5G modems, mm -hmm. but that they didn't expect to see them in consumer, advice, consumer devices until 2020. Uh, Rivera did say that the enterprise and business equipment might see 5G modems uh, sometime next, sometime later this year. Um, this seems consistent that Intel's only modem customer, Apple, uh, won't produce a 5G device in 2019. Uh, all the rumors that I've seen point to a, to a 5G iPhone sometime in 2020. Uh, Intel has a lot of irons in the fire with potential router and automotive 5G modem markets. But is their decision not to get into the modem licensing business going to cost them in the market in the long run? I doubt it. Uh, I think it was funny the way that they positioned it. Uh, some quotes from Bob Swan, Intel CEO, implying that Qualcomm, who does license uh, 5G technology, is essentially a patent troll and they're taking the high ground. Well, you know, I don't know if I've ever seen Intel take the high ground anywhere at any point, but uh, it is a good way to deflect from the fact that they have yet another product delay. You know, we, we hear about other chips, you know, being delayed or manufacturing processes being delayed and now 5G modems. It's like, well, I guess it doesn't matter since the 5G rollout is going to be delayed because of the anti Huawei campaign, campaign anyway. So and we'll get 5G someday. Maybe my kids, when they finally get their cell phones in the next you know, 10 years or whatever, will have 5G. Yeah, the uh, as a friend of mine in the wireless community said, um, 5G won't be a thing until the iPhone, what, 13 comes out when Apple finally embraces 5G technology. Uh, someone was joking around about this. They remembered back when the, the very first LTE enabled phones came out, uh, they were enormous hot and had no battery life because you haven't optimized the modems to work yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we all know that Johnny Ive is probably one of the most particular people on this planet. So I don't see this being a huge concern for people for the time being. Yeah, if Intel's a little bit late delivering those modems, maybe later this year, um, Apple just puts off their plans for another six months or something like that. But in the long run, I don't think this is gonna be a huge deal. And I don't know about you, but I don't see a huge consumer demand for 5G. Everybody's still using their LTE equipment and getting their FaceTime or their streaming videos or whatever, just fine. Uh, it's probably in the long run better for carriers so that they have 
well, whatever reasons, you know better than I, why 5G is better and, and enter enterprises, but for the consumers, they can wait a little longer. Yeah, exactly. And if you believe that 5G is is directly upon us, do remember that it is Mobile World Congress this week. Check back in at St. Patrick's Day and see if anybody gives a crap. <laughs> All right. Well, we're moving from mobile devices to other exciting devices. Um, Microsoft has announced two new products for their augmented reality enterprise of the future, HoloLens 2 and the Azure Connect Developer Kit. Now, HoloLens features a 53 degree field of view and eye tracking while also adding 3D mapping of your hands so you can grab objects and adjust them rather than tapping on those bulky joysticks. Uh, Microsoft's also moved the integrated computer to the back of the unit to make it a little less top heavy. <laughs> um, the price though is still $3,500. Now that did come down from five grand for the first generation HoloLens, and you can bundle it with a Dynamics 365 remote assist. Microsoft is working on third party hardware integrations as well. Um, the Azure, Cur Azure Connect Development Kit, the AKDK, offers a one megapixel depth camera, 360 degree, seven microphone circular array, 12 megapixel RGB camera, and an orientation sensor. And it integrates into all of Microsoft's cloud services like Azure AI for organizations to help you build your own apps. Um, the AKDK is available for pre-order for a, a spelt <laughs> $399. Um, Microsoft is now offering you a way to map and display AR in the workplace. Now, it, here's the real trick, Ken. Is this going to be that big trigger that we've been waiting for, for enterprise AR to really blow up? Or is this another year of VDI thing? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, we could probably see some interesting use cases come out. I mean, Microsoft on their website had a video of a guy with the HoloLens uh, kind of planning out the space in his manufacturing facility and, you know, putting this big massive piece of machinery here and then he sees a forklift drive through it and he's like, oh, maybe I'll pull that back. Um, and sure, it would work great for planning 3D spaces like that or maybe in retail or restaurants as well. Um, I think some creative people will probably find some interesting uses for it. Maybe, you know, a doctor's wearing it in the middle of a surgery and it highlights the problem areas and where to cut and where not to cut or, oh, this organ looks far more diseased than we thought. Here's what you should do. Um, or maybe that's a terrible idea. I don't know. Uh, stuff like maybe, let's see, I had a good example here that went, came, that came to me. Um, maybe, um, you, oh, you're, you're working in a warehouse. You need to find a part. Uh, well, you've got a database that, you know, it can also translate that to a location in 3d space and kind of guide you to where that exists within your warehouse. Maybe stuff like that could potentially kind of push this forward in the enterprise. I just think it's really interesting. We don't often see consumer tech kind of make its way into the enterprise. Usually it's vice versa, some government or enterprise tech trickling down to the consumers eventually. Uh, whereas, you know, we saw Connect start as an Xbox accessory uh, that they canned it because resource use was too high until they determined, hey, we can just make it use our infrastructure in Azure and RAA software to actually accelerate this and make it useful for the enterprise. And HoloLens was kind of basically debuted as kind of a gaming thing, but now it's going to make its way in the enterprise. Well, the funny Maybe. thing is, the, the funny thing about that is, is that we've seen what happens when people try to release an augmented reality device for consumers first. And uh, who still has their Google Glass? I know two people. Um, but when uh, Google re-released Glass, it was specifically for enterprise applications like you've talked about, you know, mm -hmm. warehouse part locations and medical device stuff. And, it, and even Google Glass is fairly slimline compared to HoloLens. So I don't know. I think that they're betting on the fact that enterprises tend to pick a horse and run with it, and mm -hmm. they'll buy a lot of it. I've seen some compelling AR applications for the enterprise, but I'm not 100% sold on AR yet. Um, just like AI, ML, or any other buzzword heavy initialism, um, time's going to have to wait and see on this one. Uh, we're, we're less bullish on the two-letter acronyms than on the three- and four-letter acronyms, I guess. Exactly. All right. So... I hope you haven't forgotten about Spectre and Meltdown because Google sure hasn't. Um, they just published a paper asserting that software mitigation for Spectre-like vulnerabilities tied to exploiting inherent vulnerabilities and CPU speculative execution architecture have proven inadequate and still pose a substantial performance penalty. Researchers found that no single mitigation technique was effective in all instances and found a performance drop of up to 33% for, broad, for the broadest mitigations designed to 
catch every possibility of Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, the combination of multiple mitigations required carefully weighing the security benefits versus the drop in performance. Researchers found that general purpose Spectre family attack could not be thwarted with any known mitigation techniques. So Spectre's still really bad, I guess, is what we're supposed to take away from this. How I guess. Bad are, how bad are these implications, Ken? I mean, there's lots of potential vulnerability, but can the mitigations against the attack surface really make it small while still not killing us on the performance side? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, is there anything new about this, though? I mean, we knew when Spectre was disclosed that it's bad and there are likely no fixes beyond completely re-architecting CPUs. And Google's just basically saying, again, by the way, we have not found any way to 100% mitigate this in software, and it's still very costly to even kind of do it. Um, you know, the way that these exploits work, they're most dangerous for the cloud providers. We've covered this a million times when you've got multiple tenants sharing the same hardware, less so in the enterprise, though it's still somewhat of a concern if, you know, when a nefarious actor gets control of a workload that's running alongside something else and gets access into information from that somehow. Um, but what what can you do, right? Besides completely re-architecting re your CPUs, I mean, we saw a slowdown in the megahertz race so long ago that new features need to be introduced into processors to basically keep enhancing performance. Multiple cores, the, you know, speculative speculative execution, all these different things that kind of enhance the performance of a chip beyond just increasing the clock, which is seeming less and less practical as time goes on anyway. So I don't know, you know, we, we hear talk about maybe ARM making its way in the data center. So is, is this is finally the, its way in? My money says no, but you know, somebody's gonna bring that up anyway. So I might as well be first. Yeah, I. you're right. This is nothing new. This is just Google confirming that, yes, it's really as bad as we all thought when Spectre came out. Um, when, you're, when you're doing this against the architecture of the chip itself, you can't fix this. You, you have to re-architect yeah. the chips. And unfortunately, speculative execution pipelines are basically how we got stupidly fast performance out of multiple core chips. So I don't know how you can fix this. I don't think this can be fixed. And no. unfortunately, yeah. we this is the big dose of castor oil that we're all gonna have to take in order to reset and secure ourselves. Now, thankfully, Spectre takes a lot of work and you're gonna have mm -hmm. to be really creative to, to get that exploit working properly, there are much easier ways to uh, get yourself uh, server data. Um, as it turns out, <laughs> there's a, there's, there's a, a new <laughs> exploit from Supermicro. And for those of you who are currently looking at your wall calendars, no, this is not 2018. Um, security researchers at Eclipsium published a paper outlining how the embedded baseband management controller, the BMC, on a server can be used as an effective backdoor, spe specifically showing it on a bare metal IBM software server. The paper shows that by using a slight modification to the firmware on the BMC on super micro hardware, attackers can still access the server through the BMC once the server's been reassigned. They also noted that the logs were maintained on the BMC between users and the firmware was not flashed between uses. The root password remained the same. Oops. This hasn't been the first time that BMCs have been identified with security concerns. Um, see also every year since 2012. <laughs> uh, IBM plans to reflash BMC firmware between reprovisioning going forward, yada, yada, yada. Isn't this just an unintended consequence of using commodity hardware at scale? Or is there a larger security, security concern from these baseband management controllers? I think it's more of an issue of bad hygiene on the part of SoftLayer and not doing things like wiping and resetting the BMCs after a server's reassigned. Um, yeah, we've known that you could make modifications to BMC firmware for a while. Uh, consumers, customers of a cloud provider should have no access to that, ex except in certain cases. I mean, even in this case, why is a con customer getting complete access to the BMC instead of having some kind of portal where they can do certain BMC actions against their bare metal server? Um, and why wasn't uh, SoftLayer or flashing these. There's no getting rid of the BMC anyway. Anybody who manages infrastructure at, at scale will tell you that regardless of the hardware, you need some kind of out of band management to be able to manage these things. It, you can't really do it without it. Uh, it becomes impractical and not cost effective and you can't manage huge amounts of infrastructure and be profitable anymore. So it's not like they're going away. It's, we just need to implement you know better security practices around them in my opinion. So yeah. If you're offering up something bare metal to your customer and you're going to turn around when, when they're done with it, give it to somebody else, wipe everything on it, the OS, 
the discs, the BMC, make sure the firmwares are all up to date and actually match, you know, whatever signature you have on the factory firmware that is supposed to be on there. Just yeah, p practice good sense. Matter of fact, if you just want to take a big giant magnet and degauss the whole server, that would probably be a whole lot easier on you in the long run. <laughs> Oops, you know, the firmwares are gone. Yeah, exactly. Uh, th this is the same problem that we had with Supermicro in that that apocryphal story from Bloomberg last year. It's the idea that there's a piece on on the server that is so integrated into the complete operation of the device that if we get access to it, it's a huge problem. And that's basically what a BMC is designed to do. Yes, you can control the whole thing. Anyone who's ever used iDRAC or or whatever mm -hmm. IBM's version of that is knows this, and yeah, you protect those things. But you know, in comparison to the the previous example, you know, this is the equivalent of I can use all these clever software tricks to figure out how to unlock your door remotely, or I could just go kick the back door in. Um, one of them is way more effective, totally not high tech, and much cheaper in the long run. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that that's just about going to do it for this. February 27th episode of the Gestalt IT Rundown. I hope you guys will go out and enjoy some lunch and have some strawberries for lunch because it's National Strawberry Day in addition to National Polar Bear Day. Um, if you've missed any of this episode or if you just want to watch some of the previous episodes that we've had, please be sure to head over to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com and search for Gestalt IT. Um, you can also catch up with some of the episodes here on the Facebook page. We really appreciate your patronage. Make sure you drop us a like if you haven't already. We want to help the channel grow a little bit and make sure that everybody can see all these wonderful news broadcasts. Ken, if people want to follow along with some of the stuff that you're doing, where can they find out more about you? Check out my writing on gestaltit.com or follow me on Twitter at Ken Nalbone. Awesome. And you can follow me on Twitter as at Networking Nerd. Uh, you can also check out my writing on gestaltit.com as well as my blog at networkingnerd.net. And if you want to follow along with some of the great things that we do here at Gestalt IT, please make sure you follow us on Twitter as at Gestalt IT. Um, you can catch us on Facebook every Wednesday at 1230 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Grab some lunch and uh, hang out with your best friends. And don't forget that this week we've got Storage Field Day going on. As a matter of fact, Stephen Foskett just introduced the first company, Weka IO. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we have a lot of great presentations going on, including some awesome surprises. You want to tune in later today to see the first one of those. Um, I bet you it'll be wearing a Hawaiian shirt. Head over to techfieldday.com and click on the link for Storage Field Day, and you'll catch a live streaming video of all of the presentations. You can also check out the presenters and the delegates. Um, we're going to tune out today. Uh, we're going to go learn all about some of the awesome storage stuff that's going on, and we hope that you join us there too. But for Tom Hollingsworth, Ken Nalbone, the great folks at Gestalt IT and Tech Field Day, we wish you all a very super and very sparkly.